Norman Dodd had lived and worked around the movers and shakers of the world his entire life. He was a banker, amongst other things. And these movers and shakers, many of them Illuminati, they thought that Norman Dodd was one of them. So they freely talked to him. But at one point, after having rubbed shoulders with them for years, he realized how they were running the world. And he put together this model, and he showed it to Alexander Sox, one of the most powerful men at that time in the nation. And Alexander Sox said, I can't w stay here in the room and listen to you explain this if you want to be alive. That's how right on it was. There are six elements to this world system. Order, represented by the state, wisdom, values, justice, the courts, truth, the church, wealth, the prices, and equity, the market. And I've added to what Norman Dodd had as just wealth. I've added health on there as a function of that. This is a double pyramid. It has some intrinsic things to it, too. The base supports the top. And uh, you have a mirror image on the bottom. You will also find that... Uh, the cube shape is talked about in scripture as being the structure of paradise. It's the shape that the New Jerusalem is in. It's the shape that the Holy of Holies is in. And we are also told in Matthew that we are the salt of the earth, and a salt crystal is the shape of a cube. Likewise, there's some scriptures that talk about this shape uh, being a, a satanic shape. And... Interestingly, too, there are some scriptures that use the word stoichia in them, approximately six of these, and Bible scholars have been scratching their heads wondering, what does stoichia mean? If we go back to the classical Greek, we will see that they use the word to mean elements that make up something, that comprise something. I believe that when the scriptures warn us, not to be deceived by the elements of the world that they're referring to these elements, even though they're not spelled out. And originally when I had put together this talk, I was going to go in and show how each of these different elements of the world system was controlled by the Illuminati. But this, is, this talk doesn't have that much time. So we are only going to briefly talk about some of these things. But I want you to be aware that there is information that will show how each of these elements are controlled. Now this next diagram is extremely important to our discussion today. And it will, be, it will tie in with a lot of things that we say as we go through our discussion. And this is the way Satan creates a Gnostic religion. There are three components to a Gnostic religion. I discovered this reading in an obscure Gnostic book in an obscure paragraph. And all of a sudden I realized they've just told me how they do it. Remember back in the Garden of Eden, they, uh, Satan said, this knowledge will save you. That's saving, saving knowledge. That's Gnosticism. Okay? So then the next step was, is they realized knowledge is power. And they realized that if you say, I have hidden knowledge, people have to come to you for that hidden knowledge. You create an instant power base. So the first, first element that Satan uses in setting up a Gnostic religion is hidden knowledge. <clears throat> now the next thing is you can't give away all your hidden knowledge at once or you've just given away your power base. So you have to dish it out in increments. If you're a Mason, you receive it incrementally as you go through an initiate degree system. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you receive it incrementally by staying in touch with, and this is a direct quote, God's channel of communication. You incrementally receive Watchtower and Awake magazines. Or if you're in some Pentecostal churches that make you dependent upon this prophet who has revelation knowledge that no one else can give you, then uh, that's another example of how this hidden knowledge makes you dependent upon a religious system. 
Now the next criteria, the next uh, thing that they use in setting up a Gnostic religion is that you can't get the devotion from the common masses that you can from an initiate group. So you set up two different religions. You set up one for the broad masses and one for the initiates. And then you establish a cover ruling body and then at the top the key men are Satanists. So let's uh, take the Jehovah's Witnesses for example. There we've got the great crowd who are promised life on earth. And then we've got the anointed, promised heaven, and then their governing body, and then their key men. In 1991, I came out with a reference book, Be Wise as Serpents, which was 800 pages, sort of like a Young's Concordance of the New World Order. And I tried to go through many different groups and show how they had been created and how they were being manipulated and controlled. And, for instance, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, here up at the top, we've got a man named Nathir Salih. He was an Iraqi Jew, who, and he loves nice, expensive jewelry. And the president of the Watchtower Society, the late one, Freddie Franz, recently died, for many years, for many decades, had been on his deathbed. And he was considered to be the leader of the Watchtower Society. Nobody even knew about Nathir Salih. But whenever there needed to be a decision by this man on his deathbed, who died at 99, Nathir Salih would go into his room and come out with the answer. Now, another man that was um, it, it ties in with this is um, someone who's on the governing body who's a Rhodes Scholar. In fact, Freddie Franz was offered to be a Rhodes Scholar, but turned it down so that he would be in a position to take over the Watchtower Society. Now, if we take this structure with its three components that I've just outlined to you, and we turn it on its side, this pyramid structure on its side, we come up with something that looks like a pie. Now, think about this. Here on the outside, we've got like a Catholic and a Mormon and a Jehovah's Witness. This is the perfect control mechanism. The Catholic out here is fighting the Mormon, is fighting the Jehovah's Witness, is fighting somebody else. None of them ever rebel against the sinner. Very few of them ever realize they're being controlled by the sinner. If they ever do rebel against the sinner, they are stopped by the initiate group, the clergy. For instance, in the Catholic Church, your broad masses would be your laity, and your initiate group would be your clergy, and then your cardinals would be your covering, cover ruling body, and then your key men would be Satanists. Or within your Mormons, you would have your Melchizedek priesthood, and your, or your Aaronic priesthood, your Melchizedek priesthood, and then your 70 and whatnot at LDS headquarters, and then your key men there. So uh, some of these of the priesthood that are, are being a buffer to protect the, the sinner, some of them are actually going to believe in the religion, and some of them are just going to be in it because that's how they make a living. But at any rate, it's the perfect protection for the sinner. And these people in the sinner all know each other. They are your Illuminati. And Satan knows when you go to a restaurant, you like a variety. So all of these groups are patterned on that, that pie-shaped thing that I just gave you, that pyramid. And my apologies to Baskin Robbins, there's more than 31 flavors there. <laughs> and this is just showing you, I want, I want to briefly mention one other thing about this uh, diagram here. These boundaries between the different pieces of pie are artificial boundaries. Satan can pull those out any time he wants, and we see glimpses of that every now and then like at the World Con Parliament of Religion, where Hindus and Buddhists and Indian shamans and Satanists and Chuck Colson, who represent 